Evolutionists claim that they have absolute proof of millions of years by resorting to radiometric dating. The trouble is, it's not reliable. They find carbon-14 in diamonds and dinosaur fossils that are supposed to be millions of years old. The problem is, carbon-14 only exists for about 50,000 years. How can it still be present in finds that are millions of years old? Seems like for once we have a conundrum that evolutionists can't solve. I had to investigate. As covered in the last episode, uniformitarianism appeared to be more effective in determining an accurate age for the Earth when compared to flood geology. Unfortunately for the evolutionists, the age of 300 million years is actually nowhere near the billions of years needed to account for the development of life from non-living material and the subsequent complexity of life. In fact, 300 million years is actually much closer to the creationist age than it is to the evolutionist age. Picking up from where we left off, in 1864, after Charles Lyell determined his uniformitarianist minimum age for the Earth, creationist William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, postulated that in addition to geological forces, the first and second laws of thermodynamics would also apply for the entirety of Earth's existence. By today's standards, Kelvin would be referred to as an old Earth creationist, owing to his belief that, although God was behind it, the universe had always operated according to natural laws. He concluded that, at some point in the past, the planet was a red-hot globe. By studying volcanism and the calculated temperature of Earth's interior, he determined in 1897 that Earth was between 20 million and 40 million years old. Although he had no issue with biological evolution in and of itself, he was still confident that his calculated age posed a problem for it. Kelvin's calculated age was actually controversial, both for creationists for being too old and for geologists for being too young. Kelvin defended his calculation by citing Earth's relationship to its sun. At the time, friction via gravitational collapse was the only known mechanism for the sun's energy output. Using the same contemporary uniformitarian calculations, the sun could not have been much older than 20 million years. In 1903, Marie Curie, her husband Pierre Curie, Paul Villard, and Ernest Rutherford discovered that radioactive decay was another mechanism of heat generation. Allowing for radioactive decay, scientists realized that the interior of the Earth was liquid, and evidently, at some point, so was the surface. It seemed that Earth was much older than Kelvin thought, but he continued to hold fast to his numbers because his sun calculations seemed stronger to him. In the 1930s, thermonuclear fission provided the mechanism for the sun's heat radiation. This effectively invalidated Kelvin's claim for the sun as well. Based on the discovery of radioactive decay, Rutherford and his student, Frederick Soddy, became the first to realize that radioactive materials steadily transmuted to different elements due to alpha and beta decay. As explained in episode 7, each time a radioactive element releases a particle, it reduces the number of protons and neutrons it contains. This happens because the atom contains an unstable configuration of protons and neutrons. Each isotope is assigned a number, which is the sum of its protons and neutrons. For example, uranium-238 has the expected 92 protons for uranium, but it also contains an additional 146 neutrons. With that configuration, the isotope is unsteady and therefore ejects energy and and an alpha particle. Each time this happens, it literally becomes a different element or isotope. When uranium-238 breaks down, it slowly becomes lead. Uranium-234 becomes thorium. Potassium-40 becomes argon. When testing flood geology and uniformitarianism against what we find in nature, we realize that they make two separate predictions. If all of the material in the strata were deposited in a single worldwide flood, we would expect to find roughly the same proportions of isotopes to daughter elements throughout the the strata. If uniformitarianism is true and all of the strata were deposited individually over time, we should expect to find that the ratios of daughter elements to isotopes will increase as we examine older and older strata. In older strata, there would have been more time for the isotopes to transmute. As it turns out, that's exactly what we see. In lower strata, uranium-238 is uniformly found with more and more lead. Uranium-234 is consistently found with more and more thorium. Rubidium-87 is consistently found with more 
more strontium. And potassium-40 is always found with increasing rates of argon as you go to deeper and deeper strata. There are many types of radioactive decay, but they all share a feature known as a half-life. Essentially, every radioactive isotope has its own decay rate, which results in the number of atoms of a particular isotope in a sample decreasing by half within a specific and steady amount of time. For example, polonium-218 has a half-life of 3.04 minutes. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. Potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.25 billion years. For every half-life, half of what had been there before will remain. When comparing the remaining isotope to the amount of daughter elements in a sample, we now have a reliable clock by which to determine an age. Because the half-lives can vary from fractions of a second to multiple billions of years, each element has its own usefulness at different ages. For example, a 500-year-old artifact will register as roughly 500 years old via radiocarbon dating, yet will not register at all via potassium-argon dating. On the other hand, a 500 million year old find will register as 500 million years old via potassium argon dating and will receive wildly erratic results via carbon dating. Think of these dating methods as scales. A postal scale is great for measuring light items, but maxes out at a pound or two and becomes useless for anything heavier. Your bathroom scale is useful for the typical weights of human beings, but wouldn't register a postcard and would max out giving an erratic weight for a truck. A truck scale would do just fine measuring a truck's weight, but would give only a vague weight for a human and no weight at all for a postcard. One misconception about these techniques is that at some point, there should be nothing of the original isotope left. It would make sense to believe this because, as the amounts continue to have, there should eventually be a time when there is one atom left and then one half-life later, it should be gone. The reality is that there is constant radiation bombarding the planet and this bombardment also affects isotopes at the atomic level. For example, when carbon-12 or 13 is struck by an alpha particle, it absorbs the particle and becomes a higher isotope. The result is an ambient amount of carbon-14 even in finds millions of years old. When conducting carbon dating, there is a limitation of about 50,000 years, not because there is no carbon-14 left, but because the carbon-14 at that point becomes more and more difficult to distinguish from ambient carbon-14. So we can correctly decide which dating method to use on an item by determining its relative age via phenomena such as index fossils or even educated guesses. But since there are so many radiometric dating methods that overlap in their ranges, we can also employ multiple dating methods and cross-check their results. This allows scientists to rule out anomalies and erratic readings due to contamination or other factors. Using these methods by examining remnants of ancient rocks and crystals known as xenoliths, scientists have thus far determined an age of roughly four and a half billion years for the age of the Earth. This age also holds true when used on bodies from space, such as asteroids. So perhaps uniformitarianism is wrong, but like all good theories, it makes predictions. And thus far, all evidence confirms those predictions. That is why it is accepted and flood geology still has no predictive power. So just by testing flood geology and its predictions, you can see another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.